All right, so we're going to take a minute to talk about um, supporting student-driven learning. And the goal for this particular piece is that you'll both understand what it is, see that you are probably already using some of it, and then walk away with some examples or strategies to use with um, student-driven learning in your own classrooms. So when we think about what student-driven learning is, it's gone by different names over time. And so it's a term that was used to cover concepts like student-centered learning, student-directed learning, flexible learning. But the premise is the same, that students are active participants in their learning, that a classroom uses student-driven learning, fosters autonomy, and shifts the focus from knowledge of the teacher to the experiences of the students ultimately having students take the driver's seat in their own education. And so the reason this is becoming so crucial is that we need to create passionate learners. And in order to do that, they need to be present and engaged in what they're working on. We have a changing world and employers are looking for creative thinkers. They want problem solvers and they want good teammates. And so those skills being fostered in the classroom are what's gonna make our students marketable in the future to future employees. It's looking at the traditional role uh, where the teacher was the bearer of knowledge to making the student the bearer of knowledge. So the passive transformation of knowledge from the teacher versus active learning by the student. The teacher chooses what information all the students are required to know with a focus on high grades and skill improvement or students pursuing areas of individual interest with a focus on whole child development. Students sitting quietly and absorbing information from the teacher, so that lecture model, versus students interacting and talking with the teacher and each other to find the best answer to the questions that they have. Students creating the same piece of work that's modeled by the teacher and sets those high expectations, versus students creating individualized pieces of work that demonstrates their learning, those same high expectations, but meeting those students where they are so they can show you what they've learned. Students being told how to solve a problem versus students testing different ways to solve a problem and finding the best solution. Focus on completing the task or focus on actually understanding the task, which is a very different thing. Um, continuing what might have been considered the status quo with shifting to the needs of our changing world. And so when we think about what the average retention rates are related to student engagement, we know that lecture only 5% of what we hear in a lecture is retained. Only 10% of what we simply read will be retained. Um, when we hear it, it's about 20%. When we see it, it's about 30%. When we see it and hear it, it's about 50%. But what we discuss with others jumps up to 70. What we practice by hands-on doing is 75. What we personally experience and connect with is 80, and what we teach others or use immediately is 90. So that ability to have a relevant audience and doing it immediately gives us the best retention rates with that. So what it looks like in a classroom is something that many educators are already using in one capacity or another. So it could be Genius Hour, which is student-driven inquiry based project-based time where they're researching or doing projects that is generated by their own interest. Choice boards. Um, if you want to step it up from just basic choice boards, having students create their own choice boards. So they're choosing what pieces go on their choice board to work on and get to a mastery of a skill. Uh, student chosen assessments. So allowing the students the opportunity to show mastery in whatever way they see fit. Student chosen novels for literature circles instead of us choosing one novel for the whole class, allowing students choice in which ones they're going to read. Self-pacing, so allowing students to skip units that pre-assessment already shows mastery of or to move faster than the pacing of the traditional class. Student directed sharing time where they're choosing what's important with them to share with others setting personal academic goals, and then giving time for students to work on those. Um, personalizing learning based on the time of what students actually need. Uh, Socratic seminars would be when students come prepared in advance by coming to class with at least five questions and insights that they can use to create a discussion and facilitate that discussion on their own. Uh, they must provide evidence from text to support their thoughts and opinions, but it's their guidance in that background knowledge from what they read to where they are leading the discussion. Uh, the jigsaw model is a great way of student-driven learning. 
Basically what it comes down to is you are giving control of learning to students and allowing for student ownership of their own experience. And so a lot of times the question that I get with this is, but what does that look like in the classroom? Because it can be kind of tricky to manage all those different components. So I'm gonna give you what my schedule looks like and kind of show you where some of these components fit in. So this is the fourth grade uh, schedule at K Beach. And so I use this with my co-teacher and we follow the same model. So in the morning, the students have a 30 minute block and it is a student created tech choice board for math. So we have introduced a plethora of different online tools from Khan, both with unit specific goals on Khan or map to Khan. IXL, we do the diagnostic and then targeted skills for the week. We have Prodigy and Reflex and Dreambox, as well as a couple other ones that students wanted to pilot. And so um, one of the options for students is to pilot a new program. So we put programs out there that are um, kind of widely accepted in the academic world and allow students to test them out, see if they're worthwhile for us to invest in in the classroom. And then they have to write up a report on why they would think that was valuable. And then it can be added to that. And then students pick. This is what I'm going to work on through my week as my choice board for what I'm going to work on. And we kind of frame that discussion when we start based on if you're really wanting to master your math facts, these are the programs best suited to give you that skill. If you are wanting to go faster in math and maybe take two years in one, condensing fourth and fifth grade math so you can skip to sixth grade math the following year, then you would want to be on a self-pacing with Khan or IXL, targeting those skills and really pushing. And so it kind of puts it in the student's mindset of what is my goal and drive in math? And some kids just hate math. And so they choose something like Prodigy during this time, which is a little bit more fun, but still allows them to to practice math and be within that, but really meeting them where they are. Once they finish that center, then they choose as a whole table group. So then they move to a table group choice activity where they're going to play a math game. And so we've introduced math games with each topic we introduce in math, and then the students can go back and choose any of those. And so they could be choosing games with dice or games with cards um, or games with scratch paper that go back and work as a table group competing against each other on any skill from place value through math fact fluency to whatever topic it is that we're doing um, in the moment. So for our kids now, what started as one or two math fact games now has subtraction games, addition games, single digit multiplication games, double digit multiplication, and double digit by double digit multiplication, as well as addition fluency and multiplication fluency and basic division fluency. And so at any time they choose as a whole group and they have 20 minutes to practice that skill as a group. Then we move into a daily math, whole group math talk. And so this one has the less of an opportunity for student choice, but it's still giving that uh, work time for students to be doing what they need to. We have specials and snack. And during that time, we allow student choice on current events. So we present several options and read the synopsis of um, things like kid news and allow the students after hearing those to choose which one they wanna to listen to during their social studies time. And then they're uh, working on summarizing during that snack time. So they will summarize what they listen to. When they're done with that, they partner read for a novel study. So for first quarter, we worked whole group through the first partner novel study where everybody had the same book in the class just so we could teach what does novel study look like? What type of questions are we asking? What type of activities do we do? What does this look like? And then moving into this next quarter, our students will actually choose their own novels. And so when we say choose their own novels, first time they get to choice, it is a who was or what was or who is novel and they pick from any of those novels that are out there and work with a partner um, of choice on that novel study for this quarter and then the following quarter we actually let them choose any novel that they want and we have standard activities that go with it and they can choose which activities to do with their novel study and so it's really giving choice um, but starting in a scaffolded manner so we chose we gave some guidance and then free choice. Once we're done with that, we do a whole group literacy activity. So again, pulling it back together and working on something as a whole. And then we have a content area or a writing lesson. Once we've taught all forms of writing, all four forms, they actually get a picture prompt that's up and has some critical thinking that goes with it. And then they get the free choice on the style of how to write with that prompt. 
So then they can choose if they want to write an opinion piece and critique it. They can choose to put themselves in the artwork and make a narrative, whether they're pretending to be the artist um, and describing what they've done, or they're pretending to be within the art themselves and writing a creative writing story. Or they can inform us about it. So they can get in and do a little bit of research, find out about the art, the art form, or the artist, and, and do an informative piece on that. And so they get that freedom of choice. If none of those appeal to them, they can actually take the two pieces of art and compare and contrast them. And the first choice piece they get in that writing is actually to choose between the two pieces of art that are up. So they can pick either one and then pick the form, or they can compare and contrast them. We do lunch and recess, and then we have win time. And win time is a what I need time. And so what I need in our class looks a little bit different um, than some of the others. But for win time in reading, it's student-created choice boards based on personal needs and small group Fontes and Pinnell reading groups. So my groups will have a novel that they're reading or a short story that they're reading from Fontes and Pinnell. We'll follow the Fontes and Pinnell curriculum for small group reading in that time. And then they actually have their own choice boards that they've created. There is a tech version and a non-tech version. So they get two days where they can use tech if they want and two days without because I only have 12 devices for my classroom of 24. So it's half and half two days with, two days without, or they can choose all four without or three without and one with. It, come, it comes down to what it is that they wanna work on. And then we switch over to math and small group math is for 30 minutes and it's personally paced math groups. So there's a student created choice in any way they wanna show mastery during this time. Um, but we have our students working in small teams. They rotate between the two classrooms and then they're self-pacing through their math books. So we've got kids anywhere from third grade textbooks through fifth grade textbooks and some that are way ahead of other groups and some that are needing more time to slow down and go slower. But it is a personal where you are and we're meeting you where you are. And then they're showing mastery through whatever means they feel is appropriate. So they can choose that during their morning choice time or they can do that with the materials that we provide. Once we're done with that, we take a break for another recess break and we come back in and we do a whole group interactive read aloud from Fontes and Pinnell or a novel study. And so that kind of frames out our day and what it looks like. The other piece that we've added into this is on Fridays. We don't do the traditional win time. We just open up for a genius hour and it's passion projects for a full hour on Fridays. Some of our students don't like that open-ended choice. They don't want it. So we flip and we provide during the week a challenge. And if students complete the academic challenge during the week, then on Fridays, we offer a project-based incentive where we've structured a project that they can choose to participate in instead of using passion project time. And some of our kids really like that. So it kind of creates this whole picture of choice throughout different points, but still a very structured day and one that easily goes up in slides so that any sub could follow exactly what we're doing. But the students really are guiding what it is that they're working on and when. So I hope that that gives you a picture of what student-driven learning looks like and what it could look like in practice.